I don't have bad days, man. The toughest I, thing I you'll realize is that you might not be there to protect her from you, monsters. Ariana Grande's new look has been battered by a piece of comments about how she's aging. Public enthusiasm for Brexit has waned. And now, a growing faction of the population. One person that you need in you. One person I've had this I don't need in you. More since I've been alive. It's too strict. It's actually been scary. 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 It is a crisis of confidence. Empowered in our wallet. We've got four food banks um, in church life, and we see people coming into our food banks um, that would that look surprisingly okay. Um, and I think the reality is that uh, people are, are feeling the pinch because they're trying to hold down a job um, and pay for a mortgage. And we've seen both of those contexts be tricky. And, and then the cost of living with the food and the utilities is just a huge challenge. I think the, the joy for us is being able to extend mercy. You know, listening is certainly a huge part of what uh, we do in our food banks. We've got great teams of volunteers that, that really press into that. Um, and to serve people where they need serving. Very often um, we've discovered that actually a crisis of food is not the issue. Uh, what is the issue is a, a loss of work or a mental health challenge or family breakdown or benefits have all got messed up. And we're able to help with those things. All of our food banks are brilliant signposting contexts. And so it's a real joy for us to put confidence back into people by being able to signpost them healthily. So it's a real joy. So hello there, my name is Neville. I'm one of the leaders here at Emmanuel Church and uh, we're continuing in our series called A Crisis of Confidence, How to Live an Empowered Life or a Spiritually Empowered Life. And can I welcome you, whether you're watching this uh, at our Shoreham uh, Congregation or Oasis up in North Hove in Hangleton or at the Villas or even in Central Brighton at our New England site. You're very welcome. Uh, or you're, indeed you're watching this online. And we thought this autumn it would be helpful to go through this series and, and look at where does our confidence come from? Because I think you could look today in society and even in culture and say, at a number of levels, confidence is at quite a low level. I think it'd be true to say probably that confidence in our politicians is at a fairly low ebb. Uh, many people are finding even their finances, they're not confident in their finances, the cost of living crisis that we've had these past few years. And even if you look around the world today and you look at world events and what's happening even in Ukraine and uh, in the Middle East, it's like, what will happen next? Where are we heading? Where is the world heading to? And we want to look at what the Bible says about where our confidence should be. And today we're looking at the subject of actually of money and how do we handle it and our attitude toward it, and how can we live an empowered life in our wallet, if you can use that expression. And so we're going to hear a reading now from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 through 9, and then I'll be back to unpack this and say, what does this mean for us today? We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favour of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, 
so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Okay, so we've gone through, uh, heard that passage read to us, and uh, it's important. Just let me set some context to that. It's actually about the Apostle Paul uh, trying to raise money for actually the poor in Jerusalem, those in extreme poverty. That's the background to this passage we've just read. And as a way of introduction, there's, we, you can't cover, I can't cover everything the Bible has to say about the subject of money in one sermon today. Um, but let me just say this by way of introduction. I think money uh, in today's culture is often a measure of, of your power. And what I mean by that is of how much of your life do you control? Uh, money can give you the power to choose, give you options, or actually lack of it can make you feel very trapped sometimes. Uh, uh, more money gives you more choices. It's like uh, you can choose to eat out more. You can choose what clothes you buy. You can choose more of the thousands of things you can go and buy in a supermarket. You can travel when you want to travel, uh, places you can't travel if you haven't got the money to do it. And does this make money itself good or bad? That's often a question I get asked. And really the answer is neither. The Bible doesn't say that money itself is good or bad, but it does say some quite important things about money. Uh, it does say this, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, it says, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It's very important. It doesn't say money is the root of all kinds of evils. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. And then in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus says no one, the start of verse 24, he says, no one can serve two masters. And he finishes that verse 24 off by saying, uh, you cannot serve God and money. And Jesus doesn't really say this about anything else. He, he's almost comparing, he's, he's comparing money as a master equivalent in our lives to what God can be. And he's saying, you can't, you can't serve money and serve God at the same time. He doesn't really say that about anything else. So clearly money is powerful in our lives and therefore we need to be spiritually empowered to do it well. And money, I think, is, is, often, is supposed to be for our dignity and that we all need and should have part of the world to care for. That kind of goes right back to the beginning of Genesis where, where Adam and Eve were put in a garden and asked to look after it. And I think it's part of our dignity that, that God creates us so that we can care for part of the world that he gives us care over. And often to do that, we need money to help us do that. But here's the problem. I think because of sin, or what the Bible talks about sin being the way that we fall short of God's perfection, the Bible's clear. It says we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Maybe you want to, I often use the word failure. It's we've all failed. We can't live up to the perfection of a holy God. And therefore, because of that, because sin has crept into our hearts, a separation from God, uh, money, rather than being something for good in our lives, can become how we define ourselves. It can become our definition rather than Christ defining our lives. Money becomes what we have to serve. It becomes our master and it becomes what defines us or our lack of it or how much defines us and how successful we think we are. And it become, can become destructive in our life. And you see the effects of that today in gambling and whether actually we pursue money more than we do God and, it, and anxiety creeps into our life. And we value it even above the God of the Bible. And so my question is today, is it a constructive or a destructive thing in your life? It's a good question for us to keep asking. Does it define you or does what, the Bible says about what God thinks about you define you and who you are in Jesus Christ. What is it that defines you? Does money define you? And I think it depends on your heart attitude. And now to come back to this passage, there are two very important principles in the passage that we just heard read to us. 
And if you get shaped by them, then money definitely becomes constructive in your life and a power for good. And he, Paul gives the Macedonian Christians as an example in this passage. And so I want to just look at what he says. He talks about Jesus and we'll come to that in a moment. But he says something about the Macedonians. And I just want to say just two principles. So the first principle is this. If we look at verse three to five, it says, for they, this is the Macedonians, verse three, they gave according to their means or as they were able, uh, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their accord, verse four, begging us earnestly for the favour of taking part in the relief of the saints. That is raising money for the saints in Jerusalem. Verse five, and this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then up by the will of God to us. Look at this phrase here. They gave themselves first to the Lord. Let's just look. What does it mean? He's, Paul's kind of saying these Macedonians, they, they, every, they, what they came to this realisation was that actually everything they had was God's. They gave themselves, not not some of their money or some of their time or some of their gifting. No, they gave themselves first to the Lord. They gave their very person. It's like, God, we're yours now. Jesus, you've bought us with a price, your death at the cross. And now we're giving ourselves first to God. And I think there's an important principle here. You see, because the, 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 the principle we're looking at here is the fact that I think God owns everything. This is the biblical principle of stewardship or management or trusteeship. And, and we see it in scripture. And I think they were liberated from their need of things through the knowledge that actually all belong to God. And uh, maybe I can illustrate this slightly. There's a story, I think this has been around a number of years now. I can claim no originality on this story. As, as a preacher, I heard give this illustration. And I think it, it kind of makes sense in the context of what we're talking about here. And just stay with me. But it's, 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 it's a story about a, a man who was um, uh, getting a flight uh, away for the weekend. He turned up at the airport and it had been a very difficult journey. He turns up very tired. Uh, exhausted, it's a bit frustrating that, that the airport is very busy, manages to get his suitcase checked in and then gets through security and then he has time, just has time then, just, just, to, just to go and buy some food and just sit down and try and relax before his flight gets called at the gate. And everywhere's busy and he gets into a cafe because he, he wants some donuts, he goes to buy some donuts and he gets into the cafe gets hold of a bag of donuts and uh, a cup of coffee and he's looking around, he's scouting around this uh, cafe for a seat, a table, and he can't find one. And then he, he spots, well, actually, there's, if I go there, there's only one person sitting at that table. I can go and join that person, I, I'm sure. So he wanders up there, it's a bit embarrassing, kind of makes some eye contact. Can I sit down in this seat? I know we're at the same table. The guy just smiles at him, says, yeah, sure, of course you can. So relieved, uh, he, he plonks himself down, puts his stuff down, his, his cabin bag down on the ground, puts his coat down and just sits back in his seat and just tries to slow down because he's been rushing for hours. Starts to sip his coffee, closes his eyes for a few seconds and then um, opens his eyes, looks up and then um, puts his hand out and, and takes a donut out of, his, out, of his, out of the bag of donuts that's on the table. And he starts to think, oh, okay, this is good. This is good. I'm relaxing now. And then to his amazement, the guy sitting opposite him smiles at him, just slowly reaches across and takes a donut out of the bag and proceeds to eat it. And this guy's sitting there. He, he can't believe what's happening. He, he can't, his day is just going from bad to worse. Because he's English, he can't say anything. So he just bottles all his rage up inside. How dare this person take my donuts? He hasn't even asked me. If he'd have asked me, I might have thought about it, but he hasn't even bothered. He's just smiled at me and taken one of my donuts. Anyway, he just says, it's not worth the fight. It's not worth the battle. This guy might, he's a bit strange. I'm just going to ignore him and carry on. So he does that, finishes his donut, sipping his coffee, takes another donut, and then... He can hardly believe it as the guy opposite reaches out 
and takes the last donut out of the bag, smiles at him and starts to eat it. He just, he just, he just can't believe what's going on. He can't believe what he's seeing here. This man could be so rude. He's taking his donut, he's thieving his donut, he's not even asking him. He can't be bothered for the argument, so he said, that's it now, they're done anyway, just let it, just let it go, it doesn't matter. And he just puts his head down, tries to forget about it. Anyway, in a moment, the guy gets up, leaves, smiles at him again, waves, takes his stuff and leaves. And uh, this guy said, I, just, it's just, I, I can't believe what just happened. Anyway, he looks up, he's trying to find the board for the flight. His flight's about to be called and um, he says, right, okay, I better, I better get up and start to move. So what he does at that point, he reaches down for his cabin bag and his coat. What he finds as he, as he reaches down, he lifts up his coat and he finds on top of his cabin bag his, his bag of donuts that he bought some minutes before. And this horrible realisation comes over him that this bag of donuts on the table was actually the bag of donuts of the guy that was sitting opposite him. And so while he thought that this guy opposite had been thieving his donuts, he'd actually been taking the other guy's donuts. You think, well, what relevance has that possibly got? You see, that's what happens in our lives. We can think stuff that we own this is this principle of ownership, biblical. Are we managing stuff for God or do we own it? And this is the, this is the principle. We, we, can think, we can think that this is our stuff. And actually, if we look at Scripture and we start to understand the principle that's involved here, God gives us things. It's not our stuff. It's not really our donuts. It's someone else's. And God, in his mercy and his graciousness, allows us all this stuff in our lives. He provides us with stuff. And we can think, well, I've worked hard for that. It's mine. What does the Bible, what does the Bible say about it? Well, Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and those who dwell therein. It's all God's. <laughs> We're all God's creation. The whole world is God's creation. And the earth is the Lord's and actually everyone who dwells in it. And we think, well, this stuff's mine. No, no, God in his mercy and his graciousness and his kindness gives us good things to enjoy. It's not really ours. We're looking after it for him. And, and in more than half the parables, these stories that Jesus tells, are actually about stewardship and ownership and management and trusteeship. We're entrusted with things. Says it in Matthew 25, it, it, it talks about this master who goes away on a journey and gives his servants some talents, some money to look after, and he's going to come back and go, what did you do with it? And he comes back and says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. You see, God gives us things and then watches what we do with them. Are we going to claim them as our own? and be outraged if someone else tries to get involved with them, or do we go, no, 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 it's not really mine, so I'm just looking after it for God. See, I've heard people say, I've heard people say, God, if, if, you, just, if you just give me a million pounds in the future, uh, you, I'll really be generous with it. I'll really look after it. God, I, it's, it's yours. I know it'll come from you. My question is, don't worry about the future. What are you doing with what God's given you now, today, in your life, are you, are you stewarding it well for God? Or do you kind of consider it, well, I worked hard for this and it's mine, thank you very much. It wasn't just your money, it's your time, it's your gifting that God's put in you, it's your possessions. Not really ours to do just as we please with them. This is the biblical principle of stewardship. See, one day we will have to give an account to God. And do we live like we're going to have to give an account to God one day? See, God has only given me one life and I'm going to have to give an account for it. Romans 14 verse 12, So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Come back to my question, come back to the Macedonians, come back to this verse that we had read to us. But they gave themselves first to the Lord. 
How are we doing with this? Have I given myself fully to God? They gave themselves first to the Lord. God, we don't really own this, do we? You do. Is that our attitude? It's a very important principle I see in this passage that will help give you spiritual power over the subject and area of money in your life. If you realise actually you're looking after it for the God of the Bible, Almighty God has given you things to look after and stop thinking of it just as yours. The second principle from this passage, I think that helps money to be a force for good, a constructive thing in my life, is this, and I see, you see it in verse 9, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. What a verse. You see, Jesus gave it all. The second principle from this passage that helps me with money in my life is that I see abundant generosity. It's overflowing. It's full of grace. And even if you look at the verse before, verse 8, Paul says, I say this not as a command. I'm not just telling you what to do. He said, let me say this. I'm constantly amazed by how generous this church is. I hear stories of cars being given to, given to people, of holidays being paid for, of, of financial gifts just being given, of meals being provided. I could go on. The list is the money that comes in every month through faithful, regular, generous giving. So I want to hear that. This is a generous church. And I want to say the Holy Spirit will take what I say today in the area of money and he'll apply it into your life as he wants to. Because people sitting, just listening to this, will be all different views on this, different heart attitudes. And the Holy Spirit knows and he'll take, he'll take these words and use them for the glory of Christ. But I just want to say this. In experience of the grace of Christ in the gospel will change your heart attitude on the inside. I'm not here today to tell you, be more generous. <laughs> Just be generous. It's not what I'm saying to you. That's not even what Paul really says here. He gives the example of the Macedonians, says they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then he lifts up Jesus. And then he lifts up Jesus. He says, look at Jesus. That's what I want to keep doing with you. Let me say, has there been a time when you realised that whatever was in your bank account, you were still a sinner who fell short of the glory of God? You were spiritually poor or spiritually bankrupt. No matter what was financially sitting in your bank account, spiritually you were bankrupt and you couldn't get out of it. It, it was irrelevant. What, what was sitting in the money in your bank account was utterly irrelevant to your spiritual needs and Christ had to come and pay the price for you that you could never pay. Has that moment happened in your life? See, Jesus through the gospel says that if you receive him, you have real riches, real riches that never fade or pass away. You have acceptance. Jesus says, I'll give you my perfect life and you're fully accepted by my Father in heaven. He says, you have spiritual power beyond your understanding. Jesus says, I put my life into you if you accept me and I come and live on the inside of you. And then the Holy Spirit gets poured out and comes upon you and empowers you. If you receive Christ, you get adopted into the family of God. You become co-heirs with Christ. You become sons and daughters of the living God. This is real riches. It's when you understand that, that's what changes you on the inside. That's what starts to make you generous. When you realise that there is real, everlasting riches 
you start to then look at physical riches in a slightly different way. It changes you. And often there's this, um, this story, I was thinking about this today, there's more and more, there's, there's like medicine that you can't get on the um, NHS for free. And you can get hold of it if you're prepared to pay lots of money. And it's like, um, it's like if, if you've got a condition that's incurable, but you could, you could buy this medicine that would cure your condition, and actually without it, you're going to die. Your life is dramatically shortened. What are you going to do at that point? Are you going to say, yeah, I'll raise whatever amount, mortgage the house, sell the house, whatever I have to do, find the money. This is my life we're talking about. Is it, is it like that with you and the gospel and what Jesus has done in your life, that it really is by far the most important thing? It's, it's the grace of God that's been shown to you. The kindness and the mercy of God through Jesus at the cross is way more important than anything else in your life. It's just beyond comparison. Because if that's the case and you really understand the generosity of God towards you, you start to get changed on the inside. You see, and when your heart attitude is changed by an experience of grace, you find the way that you give, your levels of generosity change also. But it needs to be that way round. Okay, the Macedonians of verse 2 overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. They were free because of Christ. They weren't trapped in their poverty. It's very important to understand this. You say, what about tithing? Are you asking me, is tithing being generous? Is that what I'm supposed to do now? Don't often talk about this. All I would say, tithing is barely mentioned in the New Testament. And I would say this in, I would say this in all seriousness. I, I, as I consider these things and I read, uh, what was it, verse 8 about Jesus, who was rich beyond our understanding and yet became poor for us that we might become rich. I want to say I'm so pleased that Jesus didn't just tithe away part of his life. It's not what he did. That's not what the gospel is. The gospel is overflowing, abundant, almost beyond our ability to understand generosity on the part of God. He gave it all. And Paul says in the next chapter in 2 Corinthians that we need to decide in our own hearts what we should give and that God loves a cheerful giver. So I'm definitely not trying to compel you to do anything today. I'm presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ to you. And I'm saying that the more I walk with Jesus, the more years that go by, the more I become overwhelmed by the kindness and the mercy and the grace of God on my life and the generosity that God's shown to me. And it's changing me on the inside. See, we must let the example of Christ shape our attitudes and our, to money and our generosity. And, and, and what does generous mean, you say? Well, often Jesus tells this story about, um, it's called like the widow's mite, and I haven't got time to open it up now. But the, the, the principle that's being pulled out is Jesus is, is, is watching people that are giving, and this widow comes and gives a tiny amount, but for her, it's a huge amount. And I want to say just in passing, generosity is not so much the amount of what you give, it's what's left after you've given. Something like that's, that's a better definition of generosity for me. And who do you look up to, read generosity? Do you look to other people? Do you think, I'm okay, I think I'm more generous than most others? I would just say, please, as, you do, as we encourage you to do in all other things, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. We're to be disciples of Jesus. And he gave it all. He says in Gethsemane, the night before he's going to be killed on the cross, he's, he's struggling through in prayer. And he says, not my will be done, but yours, Father in heaven. Philippians 2, it says he emptied himself. He gave it all. It cost him everything. Mark 10, 45 says, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give himself and give his life as a ransom for many. The Son of God comes not to be served, but to serve and give his life up. Always remember the cross. Don't just hear me talk about money and generosity. Let me talk about the cross and lifting up Jesus and what he did. See, generosity is not a morality thing. It's not a moral thing. It's becoming more like Jesus. 
See, if we really grasp and understand and apply that God owns everything and that the generosity of Jesus is to be our benchmark, then surely that changes everything in regard to the way we handle money and finance. And it makes it such a constructive, freeing thing in our lives. Let me read it again, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. And as I look through the passage that we read, there's words like excel and overflowing and grace keep coming through. It's like an outpouring. And you can think, well, I, ha I haven't got much. I, 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 this, is, this is constraining. I'm constrained. In, that's, not, that's not what the Bible says. You want to be empowered. You want to be empowered in the area of finance and what's in your wallet and what you're able to give. The Bible's clear that Jesus sets you free. He gives you power and that Jesus comes to be the Lord of your life rather than money. You're not serving money anymore. You're not desperate pursuing it. No, no, Jesus is the Lord over your life. And that frees you to be generous and realize, God, I'm just giving back to you what you've given to me, what you, through your mercy, you've allowed to come into my life. God loves a cheerful giver. See, grasping stewardship and the gospel of grace sets you free. It gives you life. It brings joy into your life. It brings peace into your life. It brings happiness into your life. Let's pray together. Father, we just pray now for, just pray for our hearts, God, as we hear this. I pray you'd help us to know, uh, God, that everything in the earth is the Lord's and everyone that lives in the earth is the Lord's. And God, all this stuff that we have, it's all your mercy and your kindness that you give to us. And you just, you watch. You go, what, what, what will these people, what will this person do with these things that I've given them? Are they looking after them for me and to my glory? And have they really grasped the generosity I've given to them through the gospel of my son, Jesus Christ? God, I pray, help us. We pray, Holy Spirit, come and reveal to us afresh just how generously you've dealt with us through Jesus Christ. God, help us to be generous to those around us. God, help us to overflow and excel in generosity for the glory of Jesus. Amen.